evening. Welcome to our Okanagan Print Triennial Virtual Artist Talk series. Um, my name is Megan. I'm the Marketing and Events Coordinator here at the Vernon Public Art Gallery. Um, as a cultural institution, I would just like to respectfully acknowledge that I am located on unceded and ancestral territory of the Silex, Skillex. I'm sorry, I'm gonna butcher that word, people. Um, I would also like to thank Alternatives Funeral and Cremation Services for supporting the gallery and our artist talks. Uh, tonight, I am very happy to introduce to you Andy Hoskovic. Uh, Andy is a professor of art at the University of Michigan. He obtained his BFA from the University of, this also is a hard word, but Sarah Jevo Academy, Sarah Hevo. <laughs> Sorry if I said that wrong, you can correct me. Um, okay. Academy of Fine Arts. He went on to complete his post-secondary studies in Norway. Um, he holds his MFA from the State University of New York at Buffalo. Uh, he has exhibited worldwide with far too many exhibitions to list. Um, quite a few are in the um, free uh, the um, catalog that is on our website if you guys want to know more. Um, he as well has been the recipient of multiple notable awards and grants. His featured work in the OPT 2021 is from his dream series of work and features detailed hand carving woodcuts um, specifically, the woodcut that is on view right now is very large scale and was created with 16 plates in nine colors, so very detailed. A um, bit of housework before we begin. This talk will be recorded and uploaded to our YouTube website, Instagram. If anyone misses out, it will be on there. Um, and if you feel comfortable, turn on your mic and your camera at the end and we will do a question and answer period. Um, I will also be taking questions in the chat if you prefer to just type your question. Uh, without further ado, please give a warm virtual welcome to Andy Hoskovic. Uh, thank you, Megan. This is just a wonderful introduction, and I'm so thrilled to meet you uh, finally after a long communication. Um, I'm also very excited to uh, be here tonight, albeit virtually, but more than that, super excited to see all these wonderful people signing up tonight that I haven't seen in, in a long time. Uh, I feel like I could spend this entire time just saying hello to wonderful people that are here tonight. Uh, because uh, I see Rosé, I haven't seen Rosé in years, just like the biggest hug has to go to Rosé, so remarkable. We were young kids when we last saw each other, so remarkable. Um, but. I also will be talking about some really important things to me, uh, one being so much about Canada um, and the work that uh, developed in fact in Canada that led to uh, the ideas that I am now uh, exploring to the fullest uh, and that I will briefly touch upon tonight. Um, in essence, I, I feel like I could be talking about Canada tonight uh, uh, and uh, acknowledging all these remarkable artists, uh, colleagues, friends that I've interacted with, but we don't have the time for that, regretfully. What I will do, nevertheless, is acknowledge an important uh, Canadian artist that I've worked with um, and, and the kind of impact that uh, you will see in the work that I will be talking about um, tonight. Um, I also, um, really wanna uh, uh, express my uh, special thanks and gratitude to Lubos and Breyer, the, 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 the masterminds, the, the brilliant uh, creative minds, artists, curator, uh, um, uh, who are the people who started the uh, triennial. Um, uh, as, as Megan pointed out, um, I've had a, a few exhibitions here and there, but I must admit when I exhibited uh, in Vernon, Canada uh, in 2015 for the first time, I was really excited about that new exhibition. And when Lubos contacted me last year to inform me that the exhibition is moving forward this year, I was beyond excited. In fact, this was the first 
a, a COVID exhibition that I began to sort of imagine a post-COVID life. And so I'm immensely grateful for this exceptional um, exhibition that is happening in Canada. I think it's going to um, not necessarily, and this is not important, grow in size, but I think it's going to grow in importance as one of the premier exhibitions that is out there. So I'm, I'm very excited um, that this opportunity presented itself and that I'm now uh, um, part of this. So thank you, Briar and, and Lubos for this wonderful opportunity. Um, I'm going to um, uh, show the, the, the presentation here and um, I will share a screen here and um, the, 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 the presentation is called Dream a reflection. This presentation focuses on a specific work that is currently in the exhibition at um, the Vernon Public Art Gallery. And that work is this large scale uh, color woodcut. Um, this work is called um, Oblak or Cloud, Sacrifice of Zuleha. I will come at the very end of my presentation to talk a little bit more about this work. But the main premise of my talk tonight is to have a reflection about how I got to the point of producing this work. So uh, with that in mind, um, I will um, talk about briefly um, about how this series called Dream developed. Um, this work is the most recent body of work I've produced. Uh, I started it uh, in Poland, um, Krakow, during my Fulbright senior scholar year. And this series uh, began to slowly emerge. I see this series as an allegorical tale, um, a sort of a, a, a personal memoir, so to speak, about displacement and my faith in the orthodoxy of visual image. Uh, one thing that I want to state here is that I've always uh, seen myself as a visual storyteller. My practice is deeply rooted in the conundrum of what it is to produce a visual image. Um, I see myself in the line of people who have used uh, visual images, especially in the field of print, such as uh, Kiki Smith, um, Keitha Kolwitz, and all the way back to uh, Francisco Goya and William Hoggard. And so, my work is, is deeply rooted in that kind of conundrum of what it is to produce a visual image. As an image maker, I also work um, in a medium that is specific to that form of visual communication, it's print. And through printmaking, I make these images. And um, with that in mind, I will briefly glance through some of these works. Um, Perhaps there will be another opportunity to speak about these pieces individually. But this body of work is something that has been in the making for a number of years, but the full production began to take shape in 2018. And I've been uh, extraordinarily grateful uh, and lucky uh, above all to have had uh, a remarkable student of mine, Emily Legleitner, who graduated from STEM School of Art and Design at the University of Michigan a couple of years ago, but has been engaged in this production uh, for the past uh, three years. Um, and here you see uh, these prints on display at the studio where I work. Uh, each work develops in its own way. It has its own um, sort of uh, um, a strategy, so to speak. There is an immense involvement in terms of visual information that precedes every one of these works through what I would um, uh, uh, state as a sort of um, a, a merging of um, both research, but also a, a combined practice of both analog and digital uh, realm only to produce um, 
extremely labor intensive uh, block prints that oftentimes take about uh, um, a year or two pro to produce. So this is the earliest one in the group. And we, Emily and I just recently printed uh, a few impressions of this work, but the making of this work started sometimes in 2018. And given the scale, the complexity of uh, making of these works, they have all taken a considerable amount of time. I'm gonna leave it on that note, but some of you uh, may be familiar with the prints that I've made over the course of years. Um, and, and my most ambitious series of prints called Majestic, uh, Majestic series. This body of work, I worked for a number of years, um, initially starting in uh, early 2000. And this body of work evolved into an ambitious undertaking that has been shown in various venues throughout the world. But it also has been a body of work that has existed as a unique configuration. What I mean by that is that depending on the context in which these works have been shown, they could be shuffled within the gallery space, museum, but even non-conventional museum spaces where these works could be presented in various capacities. Um, the time doesn't allow us to go into um, any of these works more into detail, but I will tell you one particular conundrum that I faced throughout the production of this work, which was um, where do I run a course of this particular investigation of visual language in which an image is accompanied by the text and where the act of reading the image and the act of reading the text are in fact, um, at the intersection of each other. Now, uh, there is nothing new to that. This conundrum has existed for generations, arguably for centuries. But for me, those opportunities presented both great challenges, but also um, sort of uh, challenges in terms of where do I go from there? So this body of work continued for over a decade. And I have, um, always attempted to situate this body of work within considerably broader, um, arguably more inclusive, but also more ambiguous, um, a personal domain where the images and the texts and the narratives and the context in which panels would be shown, for example, as you can see here, double prints, in proximity of the plates that are not necessarily used to make these prints. All of that posed opportunities as well as challenges. For years, I wanted to challenge myself what it is to uh, use something as labor intensive as analog woodblock carving, especially in this time and age where images are so quickly produced. They're produced at the tip of one's finger that one can in a matter of day, a single day, post dozens of Instagram images and quickly fulfill that objective of navigating and storytelling through visual information. And um, I myself, uh, on the other hand, paradoxically went in the opposite direction which was that I um, labored rather meticulously over the course of extended periods of time, oftentimes years. Some people have seen me in action in Omaha, Nebraska, while I was at Bema Center for Contemporary Art, to McDowell overseas and many other places. And people always sort of wondered what is indeed the um, intent of that kind of pursuit. But for me, it was not merely a means to an end, but an opportunity to uh, grapple with the question of memory. The act of making these marks within the plates for me became a very potent way of attempting to record memory, not merely through what is on the block and or the printed image, but by virtue of looking at the printed image and the block, I could and this may sound a bit uh, inflated, 
but really I could reconstruct the moments in my immediate proximity. And those moments could quickly point out to more um, and larger social events that happened in those moments. So um, looking at this block, Moderna, I carved this block while living in North Carolina. And that period over the course of uh, several months profoundly impacted my take on the United States. This block, uh, uh, Chalaluna Cuesta Sera, was carved in Virginia. And um, that is where many of the questions that we are asking today in the context of especially our American life, in fact, began to take shape. Uh, and this was in 2004. So long story short, um, I really wanted to pull myself away from woodcut. Believe it or not, it was a challenge that I proposed to myself, but I didn't know how. Around 2010, my mother, who is pictured in this image here, passed away. Uh, she was ill and she and her health, of course, were uh, profoundly affected by um, cataclysmic tremor that, that fell onto the country of my birth, uh, former Yugoslavia, specifically the city of Sarajevo and Bosnia and Herzegovina. I was in my early 20s already in this country, meaning the United States. This was 31 years ago. Um, and um, the war and the aftermath of the war profoundly changed both the course of my own life, but the course of life of everyone from that world that I knew of. My mother was affected by it because she was there just within a mile of the front line. And her experience was so horrific to the point that she uh, refused to engage in conversations with me about what she considered petty things from my American life. But here's a bigger story in this particular case. It's the story that this woman, my mother, uh, actually grew up uh, formed her profoundly transformative identity uh, or her identity was profoundly transformed by the events of the Second World War, uh, especially in Europe and especially in Yugoslavia. This is the time when many women emerge as uh, the leaders, um, especially in, in that context. And my mother, even though she was young, she was only 12, she uh, nevertheless kind of felt the tremor of that kind of way of life. And so one of the things that she identified was um, a strong voice that many of her um, classmates, women in particular had. She left her household uh, at age of 12 because the law was instituted that women had to have a mandatory four years of elementary school, which she completed. But in her village in the mountains of Bosnia, there was no middle and uh, high school. So she left and at age of 12, she left permanently. So this is her generation. This is not her, but this would have been her in the context of that transformative way of life that clearly, and as I said, profoundly impacted her own identity, which only began to sort of fully identify itself when um, I visited Bosnia in 2010 to attend her funeral. On my way to attend to her funeral, we sort of had to scramble a trip, so to speak. Um, it was a challenge, but we drove through some of the most magnificent landscape that I recall, karst landscape of southeastern and southern um, Herzegovina. And we drove through communities that were indeed really ancient. Um, these would have been the tombstones of uh, our ancestors. They were a combination of proto-Christians, really sort of a pagan form of Christianity. Um, and that kind of 
realization for the person that I had become at that point with my, um, what shall I call it, um, sort of in the moment uh, way of living American life really impacted my sort of reckoning what it is that really uh, happened there, happened in that time between 1992 and 1995, but really generations and generations before even my mother came on the scene. So just as we drove through this incredible landscape, we also encountered the, the traces of the war that were just uh, um, disheartening to the point of uh, um, kind of not just emotions, but just a recognition that the proximity to a war of that scope um, is far more complex than what we might think, uh, observing it on our cameras and reading in newspapers and so on and so forth. What we see here is a 16th century, so that would have been High Renaissance bridge that uh, was built uh, during the Ottoman rule of Bosnia. And the bridge was completely decimated because it was the connector between two neighborhoods and two communities. And um, many of you um, would sort of quickly connect with that part of the world that um, people uh, of different ethnic nationalities, but more importantly, religious groups that have populated that region for millennia have resided in this region. And so seeing this bridge in this state, and this is the bridge completely reconstructed, uh, also impacted me uh, profoundly. Not just the destruction of the bridge, but the idea that the bridge and the name of this town is actually the city of bridges, Mostar, um, is the connector. So having lived in the United States in many places from New York, New York State to California to Nebraska, uh, North Carolina, Indiana, Michigan, I have always been mindful and aware of the proximity of um, different and diverse groups of people. And um, I never really thought in those terms in my own case until, of course, uh, I encountered that. So I had this immense urge, what shall I say, um, to really reflect on that. I didn't know how. Um, it seemed daunting in so many ways. It seemed larger than life. One thing I clearly knew that I cannot make illustrations. Uh, that's not uh, uh, what um, art making is about. And that process has to uh, be the driving force. Just around that time, I have encou I encountered one of the most remarkable collaborators and, and dear colleagues and, and friends uh, that I've met in my career, uh, a Tamarin uh, trained master printer, Jill Graham uh, from Toronto. I had uh, an opportunity uh, to participate in an artist residency at the Open Studio. And I had just around that time also moved to Michigan. And so realizing that I am within four to five hour drive to Toronto, um, I quickly seized on the opportunity of what was initially a short, I think four or five month residency to spending many, many uh, uh, visits in Toronto working with Jill. And so this is just a fragment of the crossing series that was largely informed by some of the reflections I had after traveling to Bosnia in 2010. And for the first time visiting the sites of my mother, my ancestors, but also visiting these remote villages and hamlets in the mountains that had witnessed um, horrific war, but also ethnic cleansing and uh, removal of substantial population from those communities where they had resided for centuries. 
And so this body of work grew um, serendipitously, really. My proximity to Toronto, meeting Jill at the open studio, and uh, Jill sort of really throwing ball my way, saying, Andy, have you considered doing work in lithography? And so um, I must really credit the last decade of my um, professional uh, um, career, but more than that, my, my immersion into image making and storytelling to this simple encounter with uh, one of the most remarkable artists, uh, master printers, and people I've met in my career. Jill was receptive, incredibly open-minded, willing to sort of take a lead, but also listen to my totally crazy ideas about lithography. Now I've done so much of lithography in my career as a student, but I was not ready to sort of dabble in it, so to speak, because for many printmakers here tonight, uh, you will all agree uh, lithography is not as forgiving, but once that threshold has been overcome, it's the most rewarding of all, I would say, printmaking processes. And so more than 15 trips to Toronto, a couple of trips to uh, where Jill is now situated as, um, as, as master printer at uh, Nova Scotia College of Art and Design University in Halifax. And then Jill's visits uh, to Ann Arbor propelled me to really explore lithography in the ways that I had never envisioned before. One of the most evident aspects of that is that color was essentially removed from these images. But more than that, the kind of dichotomy that I was so immersed in this interplay between the act of reading the image and the act of reading the text, where the text becomes just as potent as image, simply all of that was sort of set aside and very simple drawings begun to unfold. Uh, this work was shown in numerous venues and it has given me opportunities to really rethink what it is to make an image, um, to pull myself away from what it seemed at that time a sure bet that I could continue doing those large scale color woodcuts only to sort of perpetuate what seemed um, a pretty scripted sort of pathway. And so that audacious, but nevertheless um, supportive um, uh, 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 interaction with Jill uh, pulled me completely away from making woodcuts into lithography. Now, um, I'm not discussing individual images here, but what I will tell you the, is, is an important, perhaps even silly thing. Jill and I spent hundreds and hundreds of hours working together. I would teach through Thursday and then get in the car, drive to Toronto and stay in, in Toronto through Sunday night, like putting like a 15 hour days, you know, people would ask me to go out to have a drink or lunch with them and I just ignored everybody. But what was really remarkable is that some essential transformations began to happen at that time in the studio at the Open Studio Toronto uh, that have paved the way for what will come about a decade later, which is the dream series. Believe it or not, Jill and I would have a lunch. I would pull my uh, sandwich or whatever the lunch was, save the wrapper and uh, thinking, and many printmakers will uh, 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 agree with this. We're kind of resourceful. We'll use the wrappers from a sandwich to cover our inks. But I started building these silly little um, icebergs and little rocks and strange landscapes using those aluminum wrappers. And so people will look at this imagery and they will immediately assign a message uh, of ecological, environmental concern uh, and any number of things. Now, I 
would never disagree with those assumptions. Um, I am uh, conscious and fully aware of that, and I am engaged to the best of my ability. But the interplay between this seemingly silly, very kind of childlike way of building imagery was at the heart of this um, solitary, um, everyday act of working on these large limestones. Uh, so I built these small aluminum foil models only to draw them on a rock, a limestone, like that karst limestone of Bosnia and Herzegovina, only to construct these seemingly um, sort of uh, distant uh, depictions of land and landscape and so on and so forth. But the bigger picture began to emerge here. And this is what will ultimately lead me to talk a little bit more about the questions uh, that I have asked myself, especially with the dream series and how this dream series has uh, grown into a complicated um, conversation first with myself, but with my public that um, has for now, you know, several decades engaged with my work in print. Many people would come and say, oh, I'm so glad you are no longer doing woodcuts. This is your better, stronger work. And I would nod, acknowledge them. Or people would say, I wish you're doing more of your color woodcuts. But an important thing began to develop in that studio where I started toying with a very seemingly ridiculous idea of attempting to tell myself, what is it that I am looking or what it is that I am looking at. And so these simple um, gestures began to play in my head. And I would quickly, upon returning to Ann Arbor, attempt to do simple stop motion animations um, and or silly things like moving a, a plastic bag over a scanner and then uh, uh, creating a stop motion animation. And so these experiments led to uh, larger questions that I asked of myself, what happens as the viewer encounter my images? Are they engaging with a, a certain kind of um, visual representation that is revealing some parts, but is at the same time concealing a substantial amount of information. Uh, am I the one who is doing that or choosing uh, not to reveal information that uh, perhaps should be put in the, in the forefront? And so over the course of these years, while working simultaneously on the lithographs, I also produced a number of small experiments, just like these short animations, never intending to share them in any kind of public context. They were really meant to be my notebooks, like uh, journal notes, uh, attempts to sort of understand not what the images are about, but how am I constructing a representation that reveals and while simultaneously conceals substantial amount of information. And so this really uh, uh, served as a pivot uh, to immerse myself in lithography. Working with Jill afforded me experimentation that brought me back to mark making, um, drawing on stone, but also effacing the stone, really being disruptive, uh, engaging in self-imposed obstructions, um, sort of, jokingly saying, let's make some donut-like circles and, and, and disrupt this seemingly uh, 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 um, iconic imagery that I am attempting to, to make. And that afforded freedom that um, I almost felt I lost uh, having cumulatively arrived to places where certain kind of um, complexity, but also understanding of that complexity was manageable and I had the control. Here, 
I let go of that control and immerse myself in the kind of image making that seemed rather distant uh, uh, prior to making these images. The last image in this group that I'm sharing with you is an image called Promise to Hagar. I will end with uh, the last representation uh, of Hagar uh, in my slide lecture tonight. But I'm going to use this opportunity to unpack some of the questions that I have asked in this work called Cloud or Sacrifice of Zuleha. And uh, again, here's the image of the work in the studio with uh, remarkable STEMS alumna, Emily Lagleitner. And here's the, uh, a detail of this large scale woodcut. It's about almost five feet tall and about 12 feet long. It consists of four panels. Uh, each panel was produced with three separate color blocks. This particular work is uh, informed by a relatively uh, a familiar story in my own context. In Bosnia, name Zuleha is a relatively common name. It is common amongst Muslims of Bosnia, Bosniaks. And having grown up in that milieu, that name seemed just very um, close in a proximity of where I understood that names that are not Slavic are also names like so many other names in Bosnia that are adopted over the course of centuries. Um, Sephardic Jews found one of the most uh, supportive community of all of Europe in Bosnia in the early 1500s uh, as they were expelled from um, uh, Sephardic Spain. Uh, Ladino language was carried all the way into the 21st century um, by this community that arrives to Sarajevo over 500 years ago and so many other communities. Uh, so this kind of notion of Zuleha was something that I really wanted to tackle. But the strangest, the most bizarre thing kind of occurred, which was I have for years, over 10 years, wanted to say something about my mother, not so illustratively speak about her, but to speak about a strange audacity of that woman. Um, and how she had something in her uh, persona that slept centuries, generations of men and women, but specifically women, um, that I could not unpack. I could look for evidence, of course, but I could never immerse myself in the midst of that sort of uh, oral tradition that the culture I was brought in uh, carried from generation to generation. And so I wanted to speak about Ummah. Ummah is the world of Islam, especially in, um, in the Balkans. And one of the things that seemed sort of um, as a window to enter was to sort of on my own venture into the business of looking at ukiyo-e and particularly shunga which are erotic and homoerotic woodcuts of Japanese ukiyo-e tradition and attempt to situate Zuleha within that particular story. But why? While in Judaic, Christian, and Islamic uh, uh, traditions, Zuleha is oftentimes regarded as a sinner. Uh, Rumi and Later in Islamic tradition, there's this uh, attempt to take a different look at, at, at the role of Zuleha, that she is a um, sort of a, like equivalent to potentially like an a, um, independent uh, a, a, a character, a, 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 a someone who takes a decision on her own. And so in that respect, I began to equate those stories with my own mother. And more importantly, um, sort of pursue this desire, like how do I depict um, 
<laughs> as difficult things to depict as love or empathy in visual images without, of course, uh, uh, illustrating that. And so um, I tackled this story, which is famous in history of art, uh, grand artists, uh, arguably the most important printmaker of all times, depicts um, Zuleha, who is not even uh, named here because she's just a Potiphar wife as a sinner, the grand Rembrandt. Um, and that sort of idea of, of uh, Zuleha's seduction, uh, luring this slave, uh, Joseph or Yusuf in Islamic tradition was something that um, seemed kind of out of context. While I couldn't really challenge that, in my images, I could attempt to unpack these questions in the ways that I had, I wouldn't call control, but I felt like I could have a grip on. And so I looked at many different traditions, in particular in relation to this story of cloud or the sacrifice of Zuleha, to, to sort of look deeper into the questions first about Zuleha and Yusuf or Zuleika and Joseph, but really through that window, ask much more difficult questions about my own identity, about the place where I grew up, the complexities of that life, the, 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 the aftermath of, of the war, and ultimately begin to situate myself within this particular way of life that I have now for over three decades shaped here in the United States. And so the story of Zuleha sort of morphed into really a dream, an attempt to look at many disparate things as if I'm in a room and I'm hearing not just one story being narrated by a person, but as if there are multiple narrators narrating multiple stories. And they're producing not just polyphony of voices, but almost cacophony. And sifting through that, attempting to sort of unpack the questions that um, could not necessarily be uh, answered, but attempting to really um, find a visual vernacular as a way not to simplify the questions, but arguably to complicate my questions. And so um, clearly the cloud, the sacrifice of Zuleha is byproduct of looking at many traditions, Western Christian traditions, uh, the world of Ummah and Islamic traditions, uh, but also going beyond those traditions because the story of this particular woman has been unpacked for many, many generations. That has led me to my last slide. And I will not be talking about another character, Hajar or Hagar, but this is the brand new uh, work that um, I'm uh, showing you just a scale of the key plates that are um, printed here uh, by Emily um, Legleitner, um, artist and my uh, uh, remarkable assistant, uh, studio assistant and I. Um, so I think on that note, I'm going to go back to the image of Hajar in the wilderness, and I will um, open the floor for questions. Hi, Andy. Rose. <laughs> I've been waiting for what like, decades now to see you. I know. Oh, How are you? Oh, so, my goodness. It's so amazing to be here and look at your work. I do want to say hi, but I also have a question for you. Um, I remember your work uh, and what 
you know, we used to do and how we used to spend time in the studio when we were in school together. Uh, I was actually telling my husband that the piece of art that you gave me, it's hanging in my house still now. Okay. You're in my heart, Rose. Yes, yes, always. You are always in mine. That's why that piece is still hanging in my house. So aside from that, um, you know, I did traditional printmaking for many, many years. And now I'm a book artist. I Wonderful. make books. I make, I take my prints, uh, photographs and what have you, and I work in the narrative specifically. And you have always told the story, right? You've always talked about telling a story in your work. To me, it's very evident, even in those large pieces in the galleries that you, um, you know, that you exhibit your work in, in the way that you organize your prints together and where you put things in the gallery specifically. To me, it is a natural narrative, right? So I am asking you, have you ever thought about working in the book form in the way that all of those things you're talking about, interacting with the viewer, you know, things that you want them to see, things that you don't want them to see, because I think there's a certain activity of looking at something, turning a page, you know, opening a book, like entering into this whole new world, right, with your specific narrative that I think would be amazing. So I, I just wanted to ask that question if you've ever thought about that. I am so grateful for this opportunity. Thank you. <laughs> Vernon Public Art Gallery and Megan and Briar and Lubos and Canada. I get to see uh, Rosé after, I don't know. It will make us too old if I say how many people were not even born. So I know. <laughs> uh, we were kids and I remember just that studio, like the, yes. the tune and your heart and your mind just to me, when I came here and like a kid, all that madness going on there. But yeah. to me, I saw America in that room, in you and those few people like me working in that room. <laughs> that was my America. Aww. And I love that, like that was the world. So yes, Rosé, it's always been on my mind. Um, I have always wanted to actually, rather than make a book, I wanted to collaborate with another artist. I wanted to really, um, as they so say, you know, uh, uh, pull their brain and, and yes. immerse myself in the ways they think. Yeah. I believe in collaboration. Uh, printmaking, as you know, is very democratic uh, way yes. of working. You always work in proximity of other people. Yeah. During the COVID, I taught in person all of semesters you know that's how you build communities yeah. you may be of different background different culture different race then gender but you still have to use the same roller the same spatula exactly exactly so i have always championed that belief that if you want to build bridges take a print class if you want to be diverse and inclusive and 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 foster you know, equity, you work in the print studio. It teaches so, democracy. It, it teaches can't not. Democracy. It cannot not <laughs> teach democracy. <laughs> exactly. So yes, it's my dream. And like the 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 pulpit of that dream would be to work with you, Rose. I was just waiting for you to finish so I could say. I am offering myself to you so that we can collaborate together and you could finally work in the book form. I'm in saying it in front of all of, these people. Yeah. So, <laughs> the great so city absolutely. of Philadelphia. Yes. I love Philadelphia and I love Philadelphia as of recently even more. Absolutely. So, now with you there, it's, it's, it's that, that makes it all. So That makes me very happy, yes. <laughs> Awesome. Sorry, Megan. Sorry, everybody. I haven't seen Rosé. I just <laughs> no, it's awesome. I'm so sorry, everybody. <laughs> I love it. We're setting up some collaborations here. Yes. Yeah. yeah, if everyone wants to feel free to turn on their video and their mic, if anyone else has a question, now's your time. Great. I just want to thank you. I'm Donna Kennedy from the Vernon Public Art Gallery. And I really want to thank you for participating in these artist talks. 
Um, it's something new we wanted to try this year. And it's so great to see so many people coming out in this form to, to hear you enlighten us on your work. And um, I just want to say thank you. Thank you, Donna. I, I enjoyed seeing you and Lubos at the opening. Uh, it, it made my day. It was just lovely. Uh, um, yeah, thank you for doing the great work you're doing. I'm so grateful. It's my first, um, you know, COVID has affected the world, but uh, the silver lining for those that have been as fortunate as we have been so far is that I've been able to go to the studio and when the opportunity presented itself to submit my portfolio for consideration, I just was beyond excited. Like it just, Lubos Excellent. was, like when I saw Lubos name in my email box, I felt <laughs> the, Yay. World making, uh, 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 the world is moving towards a better place. Yeah. Yes. So. We are a determined crew, so we were happy to be able to move forward. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Right, anyone who has a question, feel free to go ahead and ask. Looking at the chat, in case there are any questions, yeah. Well, I'm grateful that people have uh, come tonight. Um, I, when Megan reached out to me about this lecture, uh, I was really excited. Um, I've been, I must admit, a bit reluctant uh, to like go out and sort of uh, like blah, blah, blah over Zoom because uh, I had to do some of it uh, in teaching because I taught in person and then we had to pivot to online learning and then we went back to in-person teaching. And so I've been trying to sort of uh, reduce this world to, to that kind of necessity that uh, was on my plate every day. And given so many people now are only working remotely, that was the only way to continue communication. But I had this really kind of secret hope in my head that I'm going to see some faces. And now that I've seen Rosé and I'm seeing a bunch of other people, I'm just beyond excited. Jocelyn and Mary Day and oh my goodness, I could just like take over, but I shouldn't. I'm so grateful. I really am. Yeah. Um, Andy, if I, if you don't mind asking ask another Hi, question. Brother. Good um, to see you. It's so nice to see you. We, we've never actually met live, which is really no. weird. Um, uh, well, also thank you very much for, for participating in the OPT. It's, it's, it's so nice to, to be fielding such an amazing uh, group of, work, of artists and, and having that horrible task of, of selecting which ones gets, get into the exhibition is, is a tough, tough job. The, my, my question is, is very, very simple. Your work, from my experience anyway, has always been epic in scale. And I'm uh, curious, why? why? Why do you like to work so large? And is, the, is it partly just the physical challenge of that? Um, even when working with litho, I mean, it's uh, litho is not necessarily a great medium for working really large, yet you've done it. So I'm just curious. Yeah, I, I, I think you make a very good question that I have asked myself, uh, especially um, I've had to move uh, on a number of occasions over the course of years. Uh, I remember when we moved from Los Angeles to North Carolina, like we packed up everything in a U-Haul and it was mostly uh, uh, my stuff, you know, blocks and tools. And uh, we had, Julie and I had a small kid, like he was just a year old and a dog. And then we moved to Nebraska. We lived in Nebraska. We lived in Chicago. We lived in Europe uh, on several occasions. So that sort of question that you're asking becomes a logistical challenge, um, working on that kind of scale and, and facilitating opportunities to really just make that happen. But um, I think that there are opportunities that come with large scale. Um, it is 
um, I think remarkably physical process um, in, in a sense that if, if I go and Emily, uh, uh, my dear studio assistant will uh, 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 know exactly what I mean about that. Is like, if you put a good work day in the studio, you feel that you have kind of left a certain kind of uh, record. And I realized uh, that a long ago, and I did talk briefly about it. Like I could go to my storage and pull a block that I carved in Omaha or Chapel Hill or in Marseille or in Krakow. And I could really begin to construct the emotional memory from within that moment. And that would help me begin to establish links with the other events, both personal, but also larger social events. And I really began to look at the blocks as a way to sort of like they're, they're almost like personal diaries. Uh, they're not, but I can look at the block and, and recognize so many considerations that went there. And they're not just manual or physical or operative. Um, there's a considerable amount of like, you know, research data that informs all of this notes. Uh, in the last now four years, I've actively explored uh, laser engravers and working on that scale um, has really pushed me into this complexity of when when we are morphing digital realm like this one and the tactile analog realm, something begins to unfold where at least I imagine we have a control. And so, for example, with some of these large blocks, people will ask me, oh, are you using laser engravers to speed up the process. In contrary, the blocks that we carved for the large cloud woodcut uh, at Vernon Public Art Gallery, I think we worked for over a year and a half on those blocks. Like over that stretch of time, a lot of really remarkable discoveries unfolded. So, I mean, maybe it's a form of ambition, it's form of desire to sort of seize the moment, but I think there are lots of other factors. The blocks carry a certain kind of tactility. There's a profound uh, beauty in, in that tactility. Um, since my earlier woodcuts, I've made like 20 trips to East Asia, uh, China in particular, and in, in Japan, where I've studied um, immersively papermaking and mokuhanga or water printing uh, and other very uh, uh, ancient methods of image making that are actually like uh, undergoing renaissance. And what I've discovered that, you know, in Buddhism and in particular Shinto Buddhism, uh, which I think this kind of identity and culture exists in many societies, um, that objects are embedded with spirits and, and kind of a meaning, you know, like uh, while I think it's a, it's a beautiful uh, 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 metaphor uh, and, and, and sort of a, a, a point to trigger imagination, I am nevertheless enchanted by the proximity to these physical things, you know. So I think they help me uh, see, I would say a, a, a slightly bigger picture. And, and the last thing that I might say, you know, um, um, you know, there's another kind of saying Confucius says that like we live as if we have two lives and the second one begins the moment we realize we only have one. And I'm uh, really obsessively aware that, um, you know, uh, there's going to be a day when I will just come to a stop and so this kind of immersive <laughs> uh, uh, um, inquiry is still driven by uh, um, that kind of scale, I would say. But now Rosé, 
that I have seen only because of the Triennale and 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 the the show has opened up the idea of working small, more intimate. And I am really going to follow up on Rosé on that note. Books don't have to be small. We could still keep your general scale for sure. <laughs> Just to let you know, we could still make very large books. <laughs> Great. Andy, it's so wonderful to listen to you speak about your work again. And we have your prints and hanging here in the house, in the living room. And you know, the work that you're doing is just extraordinary. Like what you were doing at the Bemis to what you were doing now. And, you know, we're following you and we are just, just so happy and pleased <laughs> to see what you're doing. And, you know, all the students that you're working with, it is just, just wonderful. Mary, so, it's so wonderful to see you. I, I, you and Gary and Omaha and the University of Nebraska and the Bemis and going to your home and discovering the grandeur of Elizabeth Murray, whom you introduced me to. <laughs> uh, it, it just, all of that is coming back to me all the time. I felt, oh. You know, we went there kind of like vagabonds, Julie and I, with a little kid and a dog and lived up uh, in Midtown, uh, Nebraska. But then I made, uh, I don't know how many trips to Nebraska and I fell in love with Nebraska. I made, you know, that, that piece called All Quiet on the Western Front with those clouds and uh, la, 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 um, what, I forget even I forget even my own works, but um, uh, de Souterrain, the enigma of, of, of subterrain, that all happened in Nebraska. And so I remember that so well, and then seeing you uh, and, and reading your essay uh, from the show in 2013, it was just like wonderful. So glad to see you. Yeah. Yes, the same. See you. Yes. Oh. Wonderful, wonderful. Yeah. yeah. Well, thank you so much for your time, Andy. That was amazing. Um, personally, really enjoyed your talk. So it was great finding out some more about your processes and everything. Um, yeah, really appreciate it. So thank you so much for doing this tonight. Thank you, Megan. Thank you, uh, Dana, and thank you all, Briar, Mary, everybody who showed up tonight. It's just so wonderful to I see love you. That. Grateful for this. Thank you so <laughs> much. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so okay. much. Thank you, Andy. Thank you. I will definitely be in touch with you. Rose, it's a must. Nice to see you. Nice to see you. Mm -hmm. nice. Yeah. Thank you, Andy. <laughs> Good to see you. Who is this? Oh my goodness, Jocelyn. <laughs> I could have just given a whole talk about you, Jocelyn. It just could have been oh. <laughs> so nice to see you. So I, nice. I actually wanted to ask you something, Andy. Okay, has so your so lithography so. come to a, an end or a pause? No, it has not come to an end or a pause. Uh, Jill okay. worked in the ways that I had never worked with anybody in that capacity. It was, um, I can't even sort of, um, I, like I can't quite unpack it. I have talked about it through more sort of practical and logistical aspect of lithography, but um, I think what that experience in Canada. So all of my lithographs, my key lithographs were produced in Canada. Oh. Um, yeah. I had, and I think this is true of every artist, every serious uh, creative mind, they want to be challenged. They want to challenge themselves. They, they don't want to just sort of tackle challenging issues, but they want to challenge themselves. And I was so ready for that and that experience with Jill, our collaboration, uh, her just immaculate approach to making and working and her ability to put up with my own creative and intellectual 
uh, and operative demands uh, clearly uh, put things before us in the ways that I've never uh, imagined were possible. This was not your typical sort of a visiting artist working in a print studio with a master printer, but we were yeah. working and thinking together. And so I think there was a point for me to really take that and immerse myself in something that was, I think, brewing, like ready to just open up. And it's these large woodcuts that uh, have sort of come into the um, forte and, and sort of pushed me to uh, think about that. But no, I, I dream of coming back to lithography. I dream of coming back to Toronto. I dream of working with Jill again. It's not just yeah. on the list, it's in my mind and in my heart. Yeah. yeah. Uh, who would have thought of all places, the nice and friendly Canada challenged me in the ways that, you know, <laughs> not Los Angeles, not, you know, Michigan, not uh, Bosnia or Poland, but it was in Canada that I was sort of like transformed. So, yeah. no, um, I, I feel that I am young that I could put a, a good stretch of many, 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 many years down the road and um, and certainly going back to both Toronto uh, and, and of course working with Jill, I think she uh, is ready for that. So that's where I'm at. Yeah. And I say this publicly, <laughs> it's recorded. So it's, it's part of the <laughs> public record. Yes. So nice to well, see you all. Nice to see you, Joss. Yeah. <laughs> I look yeah, forward I to the opportunity to have a longer conversation. I think the last time we saw each other was in Germany at that show in Munster. Germany, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, one of these days, maybe we'll make it back to open studio with Jill. <laughs> we will. But Jill's gone. <laughs> we will. Yeah. We'll go to Halifax. Yeah. We'll go to Halifax. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, nice well. Good to see you. <laughs> Thanks one more time, Andy. I just wanted to say thank you and goodbye. I'm going to end the chat here in the in the little. So if anyone wants to say goodbye, do it now. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you all. Uh, thank you for this remarkable opportunity. And just, I think the greatest gift that came into my arms is all these wonderful people. Uh, and so uh, I feel rejuvenated and eager to take the next step. Looking forward to that. Yeah. Thank you, Megan. Beautiful. Thank you. Thank all. you. Bye bye. bye. Okay, goodbye, everyone. Bye.